and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis, your host. And we have another good one coming at you tonight. Our guest later on is Mark Schwartz from Truth Funders. Before that, we, of course, we have Alejandro Rojas from Open Minds Radio to talk to us about the latest UFO events. If you want to subscribe to hear the second hour of the podcast, go to getjoyride.com slash podcast UFO. Don't fret. The link is right on our website. It's in our sidebar. And subscribers pay a dollar a month or more only. That's 23 cents a week or more to listen to the second hour of the show. And there's a private link right on iTunes that'll put you right on iTunes and, and other media players. There's all kinds of cool ways you can connect and listen to the show that way. There's also a studio tab, and I'm probably going to put up a how-to page just because I'm, you know, I'm getting a number of email. And you are welcome to email me if you have any issues at martin at podcastufo.com. Well, it's time to thank a few, at least some new subscribers at the $5 a month and higher uh, fees. And by the way, the campaign is going really well. I appreciate everyone supporting. And if you can't support us, I do appreciate you listening. I appreciate every single listener. I'll put it that way. Uh, A couple of names out there I want to do a shout out on is uh, someone who's actually given us some music. You're going to hear some of it later on tonight. Uh, Bruce Rainier. Uh, Thank you, Bruce. And we have another Bruce, and his his name is Bruce F. Now, I'm only going to give the initial of the last name unless you email me at martin at podcastufo.com and say, go ahead and use my full name, Um, and I will shout out the full name if you'd like. And we have a Gabe W., um, and he is from overseas, I can tell that, and so is Anders J., and then we have a David M. Um, so, and we have a lot of uh, $1 subscribers. I want to thank you all for that. I mean, uh, we have so many people subscribing that other podcasts that are in the same campaign have been contacting me and asking me what I'm doing because uh, they're not doing quite as well. And uh, I wish them best of luck. I'm trying to help them out. And uh, I really do appreciate all um, the nice email and support that we are getting for our shows. I love doing this show. You can probably tell, and I hope to continue doing it. Um, our website did crash this last week once again. I had it on sort of like a um, its own server, but it was a cloud, and uh, now we had to put it on a its own special dedicated server. And this is a gold-plated problem, getting to so much traffic that you know the the site just keeps crashing. I am going to be uh, stopping my chatting here and introducing Alejandro Rojas right now. How are you, Alejandro? I am doing pretty well, but uh, extremely busy getting ready for the UFO Congress. Yes, and, uh, you know, by the way, guess um, guess what I'm purchasing tomorrow? Uh, a laser gun. Um, that and I am purchasing... Ooh a ticket to come out to the Phoenix area on February 17th. Yeah, sweet. That's awesome. I'm so excited. And what's kind of cool about this year, although I'm a little bit worried about it, there are so many people coming to it that haven't been there before, such as yourself, people I've known and worked with for a while. That uh, And then my mom and my sister are going to be there. Hopefully I have time to say hi to everybody. It's such a busy, busy event. But I am excited because I know people will love it because it's a gorgeous venue. And I was, you know, going over our our program. We're looking that over, getting that ready uh, to print. And the speakers are just so cool. I mean, we've got Cheryl Costa from New York talking about New York UFOs. Her talk looks cool. James Clarkson worked with MUFON and uh, 
He is talking about this amazing witness who worked at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. We've got uh, Joan Bird, who did oh, wrote yeah. about UFOs in Montana. Linda Zimmerman, who wrote about uh, Hudson Valley UFOs and did a film on it. Just these amazing people that uh, some people might not have heard of before. And if you haven't had these people on your show, you've got to because they're great. But just have done some excellent work that people are going to love. I was just talking about Joan Bird, Bird the last podcast I did with uh, Dr. Artie uh, Clark. Six Keller, yeah. Yep, and uh, because uh, they're good friends. And um, Joan was going to be on the show, and her email vaporized, so hopefully she will be Uh-oh. on the show. Um, we can talk about that later, and I can get her on uh, prior to – possibly get her on prior to being out there and, you know, talk a little bit about what she's going to talk about out there. A little yeah. more extra promotion. Um, yeah. But uh, anyway, I'm really looking forward to it, and I really would like to do some type of round robin live um, during you know during the the live spot on this show right from there. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you you know offline, of course, um, trying to see if I can make that happen. Sounds like mm-hmm. it would be a lot of fun and interesting. That would be excellent and excellent. I I'm going to do another podcast on location. And I'm just kind of – and I'm going to do it live, of course, um, live on the radio. But I just wanted to kind of give the listener that – throw that out there that uh, toward the end of this month or just like in two weeks or so or possibly a little bit later, I'm going to be traveling um, down to the Baltimore area and doing a live podcast with a really interesting gentleman with some amazing um, things that he's going to be showing me. So – Interesting that I decided I'm just going to do the podcast right with him right there. That'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. All right, so now we plugged you, we plugged me, we're all set to do the news. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now that uh, we've plugged everybody and been all nice, nice, I'm going to give you some crap for something you did today. You posted a Facebook story. That is our story, and you didn't post us, but it's not necessarily your fault. Partially. Well, it is very much your fault, actually. So there's uh, the Project Blue Book files went online. John Greenwald posted those. They're all free in PDF format. They're searchable. I wrote a story about it because I'm so happy with what John Greenwald did here. Uh, Funny enough, cool, which is really cool, the Daily Mail picked it up, and they linked to us and gave us credit, which is great. But then uh, a bunch of other news sources now have picked up the Daily Mail story, and they've kind of dropped us. So they're not even mentioning us. But they are mentioning John Greenwald and and putting a link to uh, the Black Vault, which is good because that's the whole point of this. But you posted one of these copycat stories, I think, from The Mirror, uh, who dropped us. And so well, you you could have got it from the source. Yes. And, you know, um, I I have a good – she's listening right now. I know she is. Peggy. Uh, Peggy's oh, the one yeah. who – Peggy's great. She works – she is great, and she works really hard at the Facebook You're page. passing the buck. I am. But I'm also going to say <laughs> this, that Peggy would never mean to do any harm, so it's just totally yeah. an oversight. I think Peggy could do some harm. She seems like a person who is able to take care of and handle herself. Absolutely. And I wouldn't want to mess with her. She seems like, you know, yes. she could do harm to someone if she she got upset enough. <laughs> that's my Peggy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but this is really cool. It's cool that the story got picked up. A lot of people are, com- uh, or not a lot of people. Some people are saying, hey, he stole some files from someone else. But that's not the case. And just to clear that up for any of your listeners, there was a gentleman. He went by on Above Top Secret and some other places. Something like Extreme was his name. And his name is anonymous, even though I know his name, because he emailed me and, and other organizations and said, hey, I've got all the Blue Book files. You can download them here. It wasn't an easy task to do it either, the way he set it up. It was like 200 gigs of, of picture Jeez. files. It took two days for me to download. Oh. And he's like, please post this. But that's not easy. People don't understand. Just because you have those files, it's extremely difficult to then get those on your server, to host them online, and then format them. You're talking about thousands of files, so you've got to create thousands of links to get those up there. 
So I couldn't do it. MUFON asked us if we could help them do it. We said, unfortunately, we don't have the time to do that. Uh, but John Greenwald is smart enough where he worked with this extreme guy, and he was able to create some po programs that automated the process, uh, turned them into PDFs that are searchable, and then he was able to post them. And it's awesome that he did that, and he had the know-how to do that. So wow. he didn't steal these from the extreme guy. He actually worked with that guy to get them up on his site. Uh, that guy has, uh, I won't use his real name because he's wanted to remain anonymous, um, but uh, just so people know, you know, John didn't steal those, and he had to do a lot of work to get those files up. And uh, some people have said, well, they're kind of free, lots of them on, on a site called Fold3, but they are all pictures. Uh, you can't, you know, the searchability is nowhere near as nice as these PDFs, which you can easily download uh, from John Greenwald's site. So it is a feat. It is great. Uh, when I research Blue Book, you know, it used to be very difficult to find those files. Even with Fold3, it was uh, a bit of an effort. Um, but And I had to pay to get access to download those at Fold3 when I first went on there. Um, now they offer them for free. But if I had the Greenwald database... Uh, I would, and I even though I have them on a on a hard drive that I uh, schlep around, I'm actually just going to use John Greenwald's site from here on out to access those, uh, because it's been difficult to get to all of the Blue Book files prior to this. So I think it's a big deal. I'm it glad is. these other stories have picked it up and are running with it as well. I think it's I think it's absolutely great, and uh, yeah, that website above top secret gets uh, traffic like. You can't believe, and this is only going to yeah. it's going to excel, you know, even higher. Well, th these are all on uh, the Black Vault. Oh, the Black Vault. Yeah. What was I thinking? Above Top Secret. I had mentioned Above Top Secret because uh, originally that 200 gig download was uh, posted on Above Top Secret. Ah, okay. All um, right. And that's why people think John just stole those and posted those. But uh, he did do it in cooperation, and he did get credit on his site, too. So there's some conspiracy theories out there uh, that I would like to quelch <laughs> yeah. that uh, John deserves the credit he's getting. Yeah. Yeah. John's a good guy. He's going to be on the show soon, he says. Hopefully Great. he will be. He, uh, he's a good guy. I like I like the work he's done. Oh, and this story too. Just to follow up, I did do an interview with him, so he talks about the posting of those files and some good insightful stuff there. All right, so someone can listen to that. Uh, now I'm going to plug you again, even though yeah. you know you just bashed me. Um, <laughs> so that's that's on OpenMinds.tv. You can find that. Correct, OpenMinds.tv, the place for UFO news. And right here. So carry on, son. Uh, another one that I wanted to talk about is um, just the day after we talked, um, and, it, and I think I was researching this when we did talk last, there was a story about thousands of people seeing a UFO in Argentina. This was about a week ago last Sunday, a week and a half ago now, and um, these were. this was mostly in the town of... I'm not even sure how to say it. It's like Gualeguaychu, Gualeguaychu, something like that, in Argentina, real, very near Uruguay. But a lot of people uh, saw this light uh, flying over uh, in some of the videos. I went and I found several videos people posted online of these lights. You can see people out in the street looking at it. Uh, it slowly moved over the city. Then in another city about 20 miles away, they spotted it as well. And uh, so this was kind of a big deal. A lot of the Argentina news was c covering it. In these videos, you can't see a whole lot. People described it as a slow-moving, blinking light that was stationary for a while, then would move. Some people uh, said that it zigzagged at times. And um, so uh, there's different reports. Of course, that would be really weird if they're zigzagging. Uh, some people have said, well, it's probably a quadcopter or a drone. But a lot of the witnesses had said, no, they don't think so. And they argue that if that was the case, you know, it wouldn't have been seen 20 miles away. So uh, a lot of people in Argentina were excited about this, and there are lots of uh, videos up on this one. Cool. Wow, that's great when yeah. you have that many witnesses. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so that's a pretty cool one. Yeah. Yeah, so our last story of the evening. 
The last one is for our UK listeners. Again, some of them may be aware of it because it's starting to get uh, all over their news out there in the UK. But uh, one of their stories, or uh, one of their papers, The Chronicle, had posted this story about a UFO over the town of Tinnemouth. Um, and this was Monday. Uh, the video was, or the UFO was recorded. But essentially, this gentleman, who's a venture capitalist, I believe, uh, was going outside to walk his dog at about 11.30, and he saw an unusual light. He said it wasn't, he's used to the planes, it was moving like a plane, uh, it was different colors, uh, and he thought it was really weird. He videotaped it and posted that video, and so the story's getting out there. Uh, and this isn't just a UFO sighting story, it's also a story to watch out. Uh, because this video, the gentleman said, I recorded it, and it looks like a pulsating uh, light that's pulsating different colors and is diamond shape. However, some of you may be aware, but there are lots of diamond-shaped UFO videos yes. on the Internet, but that is not the UFO's shape. What that is is the aperture in the camera. What happens is if you have a bright point of light in the sky and you get it out of focus, you, it'll turn uh, this, whatever shape the aperture is. And most apertures are diamond shaped. So you're going to see that diamond shape. So unfortunately, this is not an accurate representation of what that uh, craft looks like. Um, also, often it can look like it's changing colors because of the atmosphere. However, uh, when you do watch this code, uh, this video, you can see that the, the, there's something pulsating there. But, of course, that could be a plane light. So the video isn't conclusive that it's not a plane, but uh, something was there. So really, in this case, you have to rely on the witness testimony. In that, he says, you know, it wasn't a plane, that it was something uh, different than that. Um, but, uh, of course, then it's just anecdotal. But people can go look at that, and that's a story that's uh, in the U.K. news today. Well, you also every once in a while you hear about these diamond-shaped crafts that people actually see. Like, yeah. for instance, um, I believe the Cash Landrum case. I believe that yeah. was uh, Cash Landrum. True, and it was more of a taller diamond shape. So that's a good point. That doesn't mean that people haven't seen diamond-shaped craft. But uh, this story all day has make it out, going over and over in my head is shine bright like a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond. But uh, now I've got that stuck in your listener's head as well. Yeah, and mine. Thanks a lot, buddy. Hey, uh -huh. we'll, we'll be talking to you next week. All right. Awesome. Thanks, man. My pleasure. And uh, so hang in there, and we'll be right back with Mark Schwartz. This music is by Bruce Rainier. Thanks, Mark Schwartz, for uh, joining us and from Truth Funders. I believe we spoke a little bit earlier. You know, I've been crazy busy I uh, with a startup um, that I'm um, involved in, and I never really got to look to see exactly what Truth Funders is. So the audience, listening audience out there, and I are going to all find out together. And by the way, if you're listening live in the uh, um, Dark Matter Radio Network, you can jump over to podcastufo.com into the chat room. It's real quick, easy sign-in. You can ask our, ask our guests um, some questions. 
And we have a couple of uh, other guests coming up. We have uh, Jonas um, is coming up. Jonas, I don't know, Pachanka, is that how you say his last name? Uh, it's close. We can ask him. <laughs> okay. He'll, he'll be coming up involved in the Truth Funders as well, that coming up um, in a half hour, I mean, uh, 15 minutes or so. And then in the second hour of this show, we'll have uh, Rick Fryer on as well. So first of all, let's hear it. What is uh, Truth Funders? All right. Well, Truth Funders is a crowdfunding platform specifically designed for the paranormal. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the paranormal, of Art Bell. Uh, I grew up listening to Art Bell. And I, I've been working in the technology and video production world for the past 15 years. Uh, I helped create uh, a language called TVML, which is the television markup language, and created a lot of applications um, and was nominated for a primetime interactive media Emmy back in 2010 for some of the work that I did. So here in Silicon Valley, I was constantly, you know, making the, the trek from Northern California to Southern California and bringing them the latest tech that they could use because, as we all know, Hollywood is changing and the way, you know, the broadcast, you know, people aren't plugged in as they used to be. Uh, now everybody streams things and watches TV through their computer. They call us cord cutters, and places like Comcast are not big fans of cord cutters, but the new generation, that's that's how a lot of us um, actually get our, our information and our television. So, um, you know, while I was doing this and while I've been working on all these different projects and social media projects and video projects, I... While I code all day and while I um, work all day long, I listen to old Art Bell podcasts. And that led me to new podcasts that are out there. You can only get so much of the old before you need to know what's new and what's happening and what's going on. Um, so I started listening to things like, you know, Dark Matter Radio Network, um, at, at, a lot of other different podcasts, a lot of other different paranormal podcasts, and something that I heard all the time was that people needed funding. They needed funding for their projects to test, you know, Bigfoot uh, DNA or to test um, DNA from potential extraterrestrial DNA. And so out of this, I started thinking about, you know, places like Kickstarter that are out there um, and what crowdfunding is is where you have a project and you put it online and you say, hey, I need $10,000, I need $5,000 in order to get this project up and running. That project could be a book, it could be a documentary, um, it, can, it can be all sorts of things. Uh, but what happens is that if you're really into UFOs and trying to create a UFO documentary and you put it on a place like uh, one of these bigger sites, it gets lost in, in the shuffle. There are so many projects that are on these sites, and a lot of the people that are going to um, some of those bigger crowdfunding sites aren't really looking for, um, you know, paranormal projects. And if they are looking for them, they're very difficult to find. So um, what I started doing was was thinking about uh, this idea of crowdfunding and creating a a specific niche specifically for the paranormal so people could get that type of money that they need for research, for documentaries, for their conspiracy theories, for ufology, you know, anything that has to do with the paranormal, they can put their project there. It's a safe place. Um, and, and also for other um, people that do podcasts, you know, they could get their news from, uh, truth funders and see what some of the latest projects that people out there in the world are actually creating and doing in order to seek the truth. And so that was the, the beginning and, and the conceptualization for, for truth funders. And how is it going so far? Well, we launched uh, about a week and a half or two weeks ago. We did our, our initial launch. And so we just have a couple of projects on right now. We have about six projects that are up. Um, we have 20 projects in our arsenal, and we are releasing them slowly. Uh, sort of every day or two, there's a new project that shows up on the site. 
Um, and you know, it's it's word of mouth. We actually we we've, we've sponsored uh, Jimmy Church's show, uh, Fade to Black. So that's helped to you know open uh, open the doors to let people know that we're out there. Um, and not only that, but through social media, we have a lot of the, so our, our team is, is there's eight of us. There's four of us based here in the United States. And then there's four of us in the UK working, you know, the night shift where we can't stay up all night <laughs> working here, um, in California. So the late shift goes to the people over in the UK. Um, and so it's it's going it's going slowly. We've actually we've actually had an enormous amount of traffic to the site. So that we've had in the in the two weeks that we've been open, we've had about four thousand people visit the site, which is fantastic. I mean that's great. Um, but as far as donations and people donating to projects, that's been a little bit. But, uh, just to be honest, it's been a little bit slower. Um, and I think people need to begin to trust it and need to begin to understand it, you know, what's out there. And also I think that once we have several hundred projects on the site, that's going to change because people can look and search, uh, on truth funders through, you know, a lot of these other crowdfunding platforms, you look for movies and you click on movie and then there's hundreds of thousands of different projects of movies that people are trying to have people donate to. Um, whereas on our site, um, you can click on Bigfoot or UFO or alien abduction. And then it's not so much by, by movie, but it's by, um, category. So, you know, if there's someone creating, trying to fund a, a book on alien abduction, um, they would find it under the category of alien abduction. They could also find movies that are there. So it's more in tune to the search of what people like in, uh, in this specific genre. Uh huh. Now, how we got together was Richard Cutting, um, yes, from um, Milgram and the Fast Walkers. He's he and um, he said he had conversations with you. Thought you'd make a good guest. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, I always enjoy talking to him. Now, I'm going to ask you. First of all, you and I had a conversation yesterday, and I was, um, you know, I was out in your town, which I think is pretty ironic. The very town you live in, San Rafael, California. <laughs> um, I live there, uh, you know, and you know exactly when I told you where I lived, where I lived in these different places. And um, nice and warm out there. It's freezing back here. But I want to ask you, what started you on this path, the, the interest of uh, of the paranormal in general and, and UFOs, if you can touch on that topic as well? Absolutely. Well, um, so my dad is a geologist. He works for the United States Geological Survey. And so science has been something that has really been very big in my family and my life, you know, since I was a, a child. Um, I became, my, my dad's a big sci-fi fan. I became obsessed with aliens uh, when I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old. Um, there, there was an original Time Life series books, and I, I don't know if you remember these books, but they would have this commercial, and it would say, three men were lost in, in the middle of the forest. One of them suddenly started floating into the sky towards a spaceship. Like, what happened? Find out in the Time Life Mysteries of the Unknown. And this was something that just captured me. Um, I had my parents. I begged them to order these books for me. I started just there's always been a connection and and I'm not exactly sure what that connection is, but I'm finding out more and more as I get older, what that connection is. And I don't know if I should necessarily go into it <laughs> right now, um, on the podcast, but I've had some experiences, um, back in 2007, um, I was actually in downtown Walnut Creek, California, which is, is, you know, close to San Rafael, um, and I was getting out of my car, going to Kinko's just to fax some some papers and, and make some copies for uh, the, the business that I was working at then, and literally got out of my car, looked up into the sky, and I had my first UFO sighting in the middle of the day, um, and I was just astonished. It was right before the iPhone came out. So you couldn't take pictures. I had a flip phone. I couldn't, you know, it wasn't worth it. You know, in my mind, it was like 
Just look at this, stare at this, enjoy this experience. Uh, don't try to capture it on your phone because you're not going to get that picture. Um, but that was something that really just, I mean, made me a believer. And then from that moment on, I started to have, dr- I started to have dreams and the dreams just kept coming. Um, and I had these dreams when I was a child as well. There were these dreams that, continued continuation dreams um where i was fighting a war um and i was in a war and i was helping people it was an interplanetary war and without saying all this stuff to make me sound you know totally bizarre and insane these were these dreams that continued to to grow and move forward um as as i got older uh, in fact, I was spending the night at this girl's house for the first time ever. Uh, it was like the first night I'd, I had spent at her house. She had three roommates. And in it just happened to be the night that I was sleeping there. I had this dream where forever the UFO was chasing me <laughs> in all the previous dreams I had. But in this particular dream, the UFO came and and you know the light beam came down from the ufo and sucked me up and i screamed i i stood out of bed and i just just stood there screaming ah at the top of my lungs and i frightened this this poor girl that that you know you know she had invited me to spend the night um she's like what what and her roommates come running in and it was just uh it was it was laughable i guess at the moment but i was dripping in sweat um, and I've, I've had these experiences and they've been a part of me for my life. Uh, and so this is something that I felt that I wanted to give back to the community. I really feel that Truth Funders is a way to give back to the community and for our community to have a place to, um, you know, safely put our projects there without them being mocked by the rest of the world or shunned by you know, some of the, the bigger crowdfunding platforms and to actually have a place for us to, to trust and, and, and to, um, you know, and to, for the believers to help fund the people believing and actually getting off their butts and doing something and creating a project and, and trying to do something good and different in this world. Wow. Yeah, that's very good. Um, so we're ready to, um, connect with Jonas, but, I just wanted to ask you, how'd that relationship uh, turn out? <laughs> uh, it, it didn't. Um, <laughs> shortly, shortly thereafter, it uh, didn't have anything to do with that particular you know, instance, but um, I'm, happ- I'm happily engaged now to a wonderful woman, and she has, um, <laughs> she has stood by me while I've gone on this venture of creating truth funders and uh it's it's been you know she's been she's been right there with me the whole time in fact she was the one who came up with the name truth funders after uh, my business partner and i were trying to tackle a proper name for so long uh so Mm -hmm. so you know when you have someone there who doesn't quite necessarily understand but supports uh that's a that's a beautiful thing it really is. It really is. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's give Jonas a try. All righty. Yeah. Jo- just, oh, go ahead. Just real quickly, I heard just a slight bit of feedback. Just a second. Um, uh, do you have ear earplugs in? I mean, ear earphones in? I do. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Jonas, are you there? Yes, sir. I am. How are you tonight? Uh, very good. And Jonas, can you pronounce your last name? Because I think I kind of butchered it. You did not. You nailed it. Kachanka is my last name. Excellent job. Okay, very good. And you're you're in New York. I am Long yeah. Island, New York. All right. So you're on. Uh, it's you're in Eastern Standard Time. And let's uh, let's talk about. I like. I love the title of your book. O M G U F O S. <laughs> so so let's uh, let's talk about your book and how this relates to the Truth Funders. Well, thank you so much, and I, I just want to say it's a pleasure for, for you uh, having me on. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and I'd also like to thank Mark for acting as my benefactor with this project. It's incredibly difficult to, to gain momentum with something like this, and you know whether or not the, the gum-chewing public likes it, ufology is becoming more and more of an established science, and, and it's slowly penetrating the, the mainstream media. 
Uh, and as we look across the spectrum that, that's, that, that transcends media that's available for young adults today, and by young adults, I mean anywhere from 10 years old all the way up to 18 years old, obviously depending upon the maturity level, what's out there for them in terms of ufology? Uh, of course, we have shows like Ancient Aliens, and, and H2, I think, has been instrumental in, in, in our cause in as much as it, it exposes... It exposes the public to, to ufology, but in a very shallow sense. And when they want to, young adults want to go beyond the television and, and really go in depth, there's not much out there for them. There, there are books that are, that are very deep and, and probably wouldn't hold the attention span of, of most adults that I know, to be honest with you, let alone a, a young adult. So we need something that closes that gap. We need something that, that goes between ancient aliens and perhaps a video game that they would be sitting in front of for hours or maybe a comic book that's going to entertain them for 10 minutes. We need something that's going to grab hold of them and teach them that this is not something that should be, should be frowned upon. This is not something that should be looked at as, as, as passe or, or a throwaway topic. You know, listening to Mark talk earlier about the experience he, he had uh, with the UFO. And, and before he told his story, which was an excellent story, Mark, if I don't say so myself, he said, I don't want to sound like a crazy person or something to that extent. And, and you know what? You don't. You don't to me. You don't to many other people who support what you're doing and, and support this notion of ufology and the paranormal. It's not a crazy topic and I think that for years uh, the mainstream media ha has, has been instilling upon the public that notion, that notion that ufology is, is crazy and now we're, we're slowly starting to make headway there and it's slowly starting to open up to a, a broader audience if you will and what OMG UFOs is looking to do is to expand that audience to not only adults who have this curiosity, but young adults as well, because they're going to be doing what the three of us are doing right now, 20 years from now. Right. Well, I, I agree. You know, there's, there seems to be a, a gap in, in young people with a lot of things. I think what, what's happened is uh, there's so much technology flying at them every which way and so many, as they say, um, it's kind of a rude, rude word, but um, there's so many time sucks out there um, that people get involved in, whether, you know, it's social media, um, whether it's gadgets, that, um, and it's a disposable society, and it's a society where, um, you know, the interests, uh, a lot of interests that people have don't go out the door, so they just stay indoor with everything that's right at their fingertips. So, yes, I agree. Um, that, um, you know, things have to get passed down and the gaps filled and all that. Um, so how did you, you get, how did you two find each other? How does, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious how something like this gets started, how people network, how does that all work? Well, so, sure. Oh, go, go ahead, Jonas. Go ahead. We, you could talk about how we first uh, interacted. I think it's through those through those same um, sort of social media circles. But but go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, there's a there's a fantastic show that follows yours, Martin, on Dark Matter Radio Network. That's Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, um, and he's created a, a social media. And Twitter, known uh, as the Sandbox, to to its followers, and uh, I've been working with Jimmy for a while now um, as a producer, low level, helping uh, book guests on the show, and of course interacting in in the Sandbox. And lo and behold, one one night we were talking about Truth Funders, and and we were so excited that there's uh, was working with Fade to Black, and just as a throwaway comment, I had said. Hooray for truth funders. They're going to be helping me publish my book next year. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> mm. uh, and, you know, Mark contacted me after that and he said, Hey, uh, serious were you about that? And the, the relationship sort of blossomed from there. Once I got to learn what truth funders was really about, how sincere Mark's intentions were, well, 
he he had me he had me at hello as they say. <laughs> well, that's really really kind of you to say. It's it's hard, you know. Um, and I believe what what I love about what Jonas is doing, and specifically about his book, um, is that I think that. I look back to the time when I was six, seven, eight years old and obsessed with UFOs. You know, because I did wind up getting those Time Life books, but the next thing, the next evolution for me was Whitley Strieber's Communion. And so I went ahead and I bought that, and I think I was in third grade, and I started reading Communion. Now, you can imagine anybody... Um, looking at a nine-year-old or nine or ten-year-old reading <laughs> this book with this alien on the cover, and it was an in-depth book. I don't think I understood half of what I was reading, but I needed to to know more and I needed to understand more. And so, uh, I do think that there is youth that's out there that there are young people that really want to know more about this. Maybe they have had experiences in their life, and so they're trying to figure out, and, and their brains are trying to figure out exactly what happened and, and connect the dots. Or maybe they're just really interested in, in it, and it's not there. There's not enough out there to connect them to it. Um, a lot of it is is the lore, which, I, I mean, I love this stuff as well, but, you know, knowing about... Um, secret military bases and UFO flyovers that happen and getting down into the, the nitty gritty that some of, you know, the stuff that we cover on, on a lot of podcasts has to offer. That's great. But for being, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, sometimes that can be a little bit over the head or a little overwhelming. And so to ease into that and to start understanding that there is, there really is something happening. There really is something that we can't explain that's going on out there. I mean, I support that project 100%. And Jonas's project is actually one of the ones that's doing um, the best on the site so far. And like I said, we've only been out for a week and a half, two weeks, and we've had a ton of traffic. But Jonas is, uh, is, is really starting to, to take off a little bit more. And I think that once people trust the site and once we get a little bit more awareness to the site, like um, you, had, you had Rojas on at the very beginning of your podcast. Man, I would love for him to, to – I would love to just connect with him and for ha to have him explain what Truth Funders is trying to do because we want to do research there. We want people to – to pay for some of the research that's going on and crowdfund that to help open the doors to what is really going on um, in this community and in this world that, that we can't explain. And, um, and one last thing, I know I just talked for like five minutes straight there, but I do think that there is this youth that has been watching Ancient Aliens and that is really into alien culture and ufology culture um, and they just, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, they are doing the social media. And so hopefully that's what we're trying to do with Truth Funders too, is reach out to people um, and reach out to people that want to do projects using social media and those tactics to try to get that younger generation involved and, and not just, um, you know, through word of mouth. You know, I, I have... Um Google Analytics on my site, and it seems to me that there are, you know, the um, uh, the percentages of 18 to 35 is absolutely three-quarters of my listening audience, or at least that visit the website. And so there are young people in, involved in actually looking, I do believe. Um, however, um, it could be just because it's an Internet thing, a podcast, easy to find, all that, because what is happening, uh, you know, getting back to the younger people less involved, is um, across the board, every type of conference you can imagine, whether it's um, in the field that I'm involved in for, you know, antiques or any type of collectibles, um, right across the board, the attendance, the young attendance is, is way down. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just think it's because everything is geared um, indoor and including this podcast <laughs> and uh, and and everything digital basically. 
you hit it. Oh, you hit it right on on the head. Um, uh, you know, when I went to my first MUFON meeting, it was a year ago. And when I went there, I was the youngest person there. I'm 30, 34 years old, and I was by far the youngest person at this MUFON meeting. Um, but I know that there's people my age. I know that there's people way younger who are super into this. And if you type in podcast UFO, I mean, what great search terms are that, right? So people who are looking for it can, can find it. It's, it's a way for them to, to connect. And that's, I'm sure that's why you're seeing it on your Google analytics because those people are interested and they are there and they and and it's a great way your podcast and the the way that you're able to have podcast ufo be your keywords those are just such beautiful wonderful magical keywords well it's funny, I, funny you say that you know a few people have teased me about that but that's 100 percent the reason why i chose the name i thought well i want to do a podcast on ufos what is the simplest thing I can uh, make it so people can find it, but it is it is kind of a silly name, but it, it definitely works as far as so much traffic that my website has been crashed uh, twice in the last uh, um, six months, and uh, hopefully it won't happen again. Uh, but, yeah, but <laughs> we good. we can only hope. But that's I mean that's a great sign, and and you hit it on you know you really. That's right on because in this new world, in order to reach people, people are plugged in and the youth is plugged in. I mean, I take a look at my um, five-year-old nephew and he has his designated uh, Amazon Fire module that lets him play any game he wants but only lets him play it for an hour and a half before it cuts him off for the rest of the day. Um, I mean, people are plugged in. If you If you walk outside on the streets... When we were kids, we'd be outside playing baseball or skateboarding or doing doing these things. And it's not like you don't see that. It's not like it's not happening still. But for the most part, I would say there's a, a much much uh, smaller majority of that of that happening. And what we're seeing is people on the computers or, or playing video games and and um, and doing that. And those are the people that we want to reach and say like, hey, it's okay. You know, if you have had an experience, if you want to write a book about it, you could do that on Truth Funders. Reach out to us. If you have a documentary that you want to create, reach out to us. Um, there's people out there that, you know, they work their day jobs, they come home, they're looking for the next news or, or something to be a part of. They might not go to the the conferences because conferences are could be scary. You don't know a lot of people. It is an older generation. So if we can get this younger generation involved somehow, and, and maybe that is going to a conference, but if it's not, the next best thing is something like a, a Truth Funders or a podcast UFO where people can be involved and and um, and feel free to do it in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, no, no, gentlemen, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add this briefly. I am a father of three, and uh, well, my oldest, my 17 year old daughter, probably wouldn't notice a UFO unless it landed on my house and Bruno Mars stepped out of it. My 10 year old <laughs> son, um, Julian, is incredibly fascinated with ufology. Uh, you know, he'll sit and watch. Shows like Ancient Aliens with me. He tells me he discusses it with his friends at, at school. The other day, he came up to me. And it was such a proud moment. He said, Dad, what's Kecksburg? And I said, oh, my goodness. And we sat and had a conversation about Kecksburg. We've bought a telescope, and we've got him going outside, and we look at the stars. Obviously, not tonight. It's 17 degrees, but when it's a bit warmer outside, you bet we're out there. We're looking at the stars. Kids want to get involved with this, and I think maybe it was incredibly, maybe not. But the exposure that UFOs have gotten in mainstream media, even if it's in in mediums like movies where it's an Independence Day or it's a Men in Black and there's a slightly uh, comedic twist to it, still raising those questions and, and absolutely i think that it is <clears throat> excuse me more or less intrinsic for us as human beings to have a relationship with the sky to look up and say what's up there 
what am I doing here? Now, perhaps I was a strange child. Well, I know I was a strange child, but I asked a question. I know that there were other children that asked that question, and I think that that relationship with the stars was severed. Whether it was severed on purpose or not, I can't attest to that, but I will say that there's some time ago, probably within the 1900s, and it, it, I, I do think, Martin, that what you say about technology is spot-on accurate. Our connection to the heavens ha has been interrupted. It, it, it's been terminated to a certain degree, and, and it, it shows like, like Podcast UFO, it, it's organizations like Truth Funders that are going to get that connection reunited so that Again, the generation of tomorrow won't struggle the way that we struggle when it comes to expressing ourselves uh, on topics like ufology, like well, It doesn't matter whether we're talking about Bigfoot or we're talking about greys. There's a certain stigma that's attached to us, whereas people are ready to jump out and, and scream, tinfoil hats, tinfoil hats, we're, we're nuts. There's, there's something wrong with us because we're with this. No. There's nothing wrong with us. This is as natural as, as trees in a meadow or fish swimming in a brook. There are extraterrestrials. I have no problem saying that, and I think that anybody who can't acknowledge the fact that there has to be something beyond this planet has serious issues. Either that or they've been brainwashed. I don't know. But I, I really hope that, that again, uh, my book and my project as well as some of the other projects that are on Truth Funders, they can, they can really help expose what it is that is, is a passion of, uh, of us to, to that, that much more of a segment of, of the population. Even if we get one more person, we grow that much stronger. Yeah. Hey, uh, just to let you know, there's, there's some type of signal issue. You've been cutting in and out a little bit, and I don't know if... Um, if there's a Wi-Fi issue or something like that there, uh, I just want to let you know that. And um, so, Jonas, before you head out, uh, you're going to be on just a few more minutes. Um, um, let's see, what what uh, started you down the path of, of the interest in this? And have you written um, have you written books or any type of book before, or is this the first one? This will be my first book. I have a bunch of projects that are on hold at the moment because of this one. I've written blog posts here and there. Um, it, it's always been something that I wanted to do, but I, I have to say, as Mark said earlier, and I'm hoping that the connection is, is better now, I, I did not know how to, 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 to begin. I didn't think it was possible in terms of, of funding. And what Truth Funders has done for me personally is, is given me an opportunity to sit down and write this book and, and get it out there to people so I could get some sort of momentum. Because without it, I, I was lost. I really didn't know where to begin. I, knew I had the idea. I know that I had other ideas, and we've spoken about those as well. I just didn't know how to begin. It's, it's, a, it's a formidable task. Uh, for somebody who doesn't have exposure, while I've I've written before, writing on this topic is is rather unique. You ha you can't approach just any partner with, with a topic like ufology. They're going to look at it with with, with a, a bit of a can view, as I said earlier. Yeah, uh, we we yeah, we have a bad signal <laughs> on your line as well. So um, so I think um, I think I'm going to say. Um, that will probably be it for you. Uh, do you have a website or anything you want to get out there? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like everybody to go to truthfunders.com. And if you don't support my project, support any project and tell your friends about it because it's a great site. Mark, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. You're very yeah. welcome. Thank you, Jonas. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. You guys have a great night. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, so... Let me just do something here. Okay, here we go. And so we're back with just you, uh, Mark. All right. And that sounds better. That signal's much better now. And yeah. So, Mark, we have uh, we have about five five or six minutes to to the top of the hour. And there Great. was a question here, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask uh, ask you this question. Please. For the first speaker, he sounds like he feels he's a contactee. 
Um, is that is that so, or is that uh, just what someone is speculating? Um, I, I, you know, I couldn't quite answer that. Um, I feel that probably deep down, yes. Um, is there proof? <laughs> no. Um, but I, I've definitely just been really, really intrigued and fascinated with uh, UFOs and aliens for as long as I, I can remember. Um, in fact, uh, it was just, it was just last week, I think it was last Monday, I went to go and, um, walk my dog. It was 1.30 a.m. and I walk outside, take three steps, and I look up and I see a, for the second time of my life, I see three lights. I mean, really big lights, very close, uh, half a mile away, uh, that are never there, ever. Um, I ran back inside. I grabbed my, my phone. I wound up going back, and the lights were still there. It's a little bit further away. I wound up uh, snapping six pictures um, and throwing them on Twitter instantly, just like boom, 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 um, from being there until it disappeared. Uh, have I been contacted? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's something about... The cover of Whitley Strieber's book that struck me as a as a child that I felt that I needed to read it. I don't I don't have an answer one way or another. Um, but I, I have had dreams and it's been something that stuck with me and enough to to go ahead and create a uh, a platform for people to to create projects to try to figure out the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. I I had a conversation with my son a few weeks ago and and. Um, I thought I had my second sighting, but, you know, I said to him, I'm not even going to talk, and I'm not even going to talk about it. And the reason I'm not going to talk about it is because um, it it would seem the first one was unreal to have, uh, first of all. <laughs> and the second one, like, I don't even want to talk about it because I'm, I'm afraid that I might lose a little bit of credibility of, you know, being the host of the show. Um, because a, a lot of times when people say, you know, they had this sighting, they had that sighting and they have so many sightings, you know, you, you start to think, Hmm, you know, uh, right. maybe I'm Absolutely. overthinking it, but, uh, but, uh, you, you can't get it out of me. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, and that's how I feel too. It's, uh, the, the one sighting I had talked about with particular people, or just some people here and there, the, the one that happened in Walnut Creek, California. Um, and I had researched that. I mean, for years, I would go online and research and research the date and look for it and see if anything else happened, if anybody else saw anything. That was clear as day. That was during the day. This other one was, um, you know, just a week ago. And it was after I've started this, this Truth Funder stuff. Uh, there's been some, there's been a couple of weird, wacky things that have happened since I've, since, you know, this the conception of this and it was started with uh my business partner he you know used to work at um, sort of a big wig at aol time warner he's created three other businesses all that have um done really well and sold um yeah you know i'm i i have a very legitimate past uh you know like i said earlier being nominated for for some prestigious awards it's it's kind of strange to come out and talk about all of this stuff but for what i'm doing the you know and and creating right here truth funders it's it's a necessity um to to kind of talk about things that happen i mean there's people that i'm sure have seen ghosts have seen strange lights in the sky that will not admit to it or will not not talk about it i don't think that you know the, the more that we keep it to ourselves um the more it just remains taboo. And, you know, if I, if what I saw in the sky the other night was not a, a UFO or some strange object, then it wasn't, and that's great, and that's fine. Um, and, you know, I, I don't care if something is, r is real or not, as long as there's proof and there's truth. Um, you know, like with, with the underwater uh, Malibu base with, with Jimmy, um, I'm sure you've heard about that. Uh, they discovered that through Google Maps. You know, it, 
whether or not, if, if we're ever able to go down there and discover it, and let's say it is a UFO base, well, heck, we just nailed the jackpot. But let's say it's not a UFO base and it's rock formations. Well, you know what? Now we know that, and now we know the truth, and that's all that... That's all that I care about, and I think that's all, what we what we all care about is is finding out the answers to to these items. Like what's what's real, what's not, um, and and it it doesn't have to be um, X Files music playing before you know when you're watching the news and and they're talking about a sighting that ten different people saw, and so it's actually making the news, and then they play the UFO or the X Files music just to kind of make it campy. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It can just be people explaining what they see or um, talking about what they see or what they've experienced. It, it shouldn't be taboo. Well, um, getting back to the Malibu um, underwater thing, um, I had a conversation with Jimmy Church. Uh, I'm not Jimmy Church, I'm sorry, with uh, Lee Spiegel about that. Um, he was, uh, and he found out some geological information about that and was due to go on jimmy church's show and then jimmy church um did not call him so i think that has been explained but that's like you said that's just another one of the things that people are are looking to find um answers for um just real quick because we're at the top of the hour um did you um i'm going to say i'm going to admit that i didn't report what i saw recently um i i just i just didn't and i just wondered um and shame on me. And I wondered, did you report either one of your sightings? Um, I reported it on Twitter. <laughs> uh. But did I record it on a, on a MUFON site? I did not. Yeah, just wondering. And yeah. it just kind of goes along with what I've seen in audiences when the question's asked. How many people have think they've seen a UFO? The hands go up. How many people reported it? It's about 10%. Right. So right. I, think, I think that's kind of a fascinating number. And I... I understand it. All right, so we're coming up. Um, this is it for this part of the show. And if you're listening live, um, hang in here. I have to do all kinds of things at once here. Um, yeah, and, and and I think uh, just if I could say real quick, I think uh, Jimmy and and Lee um, they wound up you know working out all the difference all the difference whatever happened. I think there was a. Um, you know they they had a show together and all that stuff worked out so that was that was good but um that part but yeah, I, I didn't know i did not know that part so yeah all right so we're coming back um we're coming back in the next hour and we're going to have uh, rick fire is on for a while Hi there, is this Rick? Yes, sir. Rick, you are on Can podcast UFO and hailing. Hang on, just a second. My uh, my computer's going wild here. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. And uh, you're also out on the West Coast, I see by your area code. Yes, sir. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I wish I was into the topic more when I had my sighting out there that I had back in 2006, but I didn't become active in this in 2011 as far as, you know, the show. But I, I really wish I had uh, the show going and I was out there because it seems to be it seems to be quite uh, a nucleus of uh, people involved in the Bay Area in UFOs. Well, that makes perfect sense, of course, because there's certainly a unique um, energy out here in general, you know, especially within the past 40 years and, and a generally positive uh, um, you know, energy out here in terms of, you know, the the heart of a peacemaking generation and the like. Right. Now, um, Mark was telling me earlier that you are into it's something about intergalactic politics. Is that? Yes, sir. That's that's the that's going to um, that is what I'm writing right now for my next series. I wrote 
a sci-fi trilogy about World War III. That was The Keepers. And now I'm working on a, uh, a science faction, I like to call it, because it's very fact-based. But, um, you know, a, a, an adventure story wound with facts about what appears to be the intergalactic politics that are affecting Earth. All right. You know, and it, it's interesting. Um, so Rick's first series, The Keepers, it was it, it was a really big seller on Amazon for for a long time. Um, it came out several years ago, and and Rick was also you know at Comic Con um, or WonderCon or maybe you were at both. All Rick. of them. Yeah. Um, for, for many years, and, I, I went to all of them. Yeah, and and uh, his his books are fascinating, and like he said, he does he does a ton of research. I mean, research talking to professors at UC Berkeley and Stanford and and all over the place to get the right type of sort of futurist technology that he needs for his novels. But um, his new novel, he uh, he's creating it, and I actually wanted to to touch base with him. He's going to be creating a Truth Funders project around it. Um, the Truth Funders project is not up yet, uh, but that's something that we're working on and will be up in the next couple days. Um, but I just wanted to interject real quick and throw that out there. And intergalactic politics, uh, it's, it's, uh, I saw Rick give a speech um, at a MUFON meeting, and it was all on intergalactic politics, and I just found it extraordinary. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I often get my information uh, from solid sources, uh, as Mark was saying, you know, also, you know, articles and the like, you know, whether it's the New York Times or, or government bureau, you know, uh, files. And, you know, this is a little different than a lot of people in our community where a lot of it is taken from areas where it's preaching to the choir. And so sometimes it's hard for the mainstream to trust it, but I derive my facts from places where the mainstream trusts, and it's remarkable how those facts are out there. If you filter them out, they're quite obviously there, which is which is really fascinating. Yeah, can you elaborate more on? Yes, sir. Yeah, one potent example is uh, the Roswell investigation. Now, of course, uh, you know the government avoided you know, releasing any reports for quite some time on it. And finally in the 90s, they released a report, and it was, it was so desperate. It was called Case Closed, you know, like just trying to shove it down your throat that this is it, which is, you know, it's a ridiculous title. It's, it's, it's not closed just because they say so. Uh, but, you know, on its face, they're like, oh, it, you know, the, the, the conclusion was, you know, it was so obviously, you know, A, B, and C, you know, absurd concepts like, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, test dummies uh, were mistaken as aliens. Blah blah blah. Uh, and he said, you know, this is this is just obviously what happened, and and you know, it's 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 just it's all there. But then at the same time, he talks. You know, the the lead investigator talks about how he had to really go searching for this information. Now, here's something that stinks to high heaven on that. Roswell is just so well known by this time i mean 50 years of people talking about it you know you wouldn't have to go investigating the heck out of it if you're inside the government and it's all just readily available and easy to see it wouldn't require high level investigation work i mean that's like you know he's you know finding out about the manhattan project and discovering that it was to make the nuclear bomb required high level investigation no by the 90s that wouldn't require high level investigation it required just talking to all the key people real quick and it, it basically the very fact that he had to say that he had to go through a ton of investigation already sent off alarm bells and on also you know many of the things he talked about were you know, they, they weren't clear. You know, when they say, oh, you know, a serviceman fell out of a weather balloon and his, his head, you know, he died and his head was all swollen up. So that's what they mistook for, for the alien. But then they couldn't find out who that serviceman was. And again, if these things were being linked to Roswell, you know, you would think that there would be a lot more, you know, written down. It's like, oh, by the way, this was the guy that was mistaken for an alien, you know. And, and, and if you're interviewing all the top dogs that were in charge of these different projects, it'd be like, oh, that was, you know, so-and-so, the guy who was mistaken for an alien. 
So it's just, it's just really interesting that they on one level say, oh, it's case closed. It was so easy. It was just so obviously this. But then the next minute, you start realizing, well, it wasn't easy for you to find. And it wasn't, you know, a lot of things are still missing. Why are those missing? Why are those facts still missing? And um, so that right in and of itself tells me, you know, that, that, you know, Roswell, it actually made it more fishy, that they tried so hard to close the case with facts that were not substantial. And that's just one example. Yeah, I like that example because uh, that's that topic's come up many times on, on this show about how, for instance, the crash test dummies didn't even come out till five years after. Um, exactly. And uh, also there was another thing that they had mentioned that the aliens could have been, and that was, uh, I want to say, a plane crash or something like that, and they said the bodies you know, were badly burned, or I may be confusing this with another case. I'm not really sure. But, um, you know, Roswell is interesting, and I, I like the, the stand that Stanton Friedman says that the Air Force lied four times, flat-out lied four times when it comes to Roswell. And, yes. um, you know, I he said that enough. I, <laughs> I believe that he's not just uh, saying that because he's a man about facts himself. I agree. And see, the thing is, um, as someone who doesn't want to be too quick to jump to conclusions, I was always, you know, open. I mean, I've been interested in this since the 80s when I was very, very young. And at the time, you know, I, I, I've always been fascinated with history. And I knew that, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the Germans, you know, had a lot of really advanced technology, and, you know, one can ask where they got that. But let's assume for a second they made it themselves, and then when the Allies took over Germany, they were, you know, using all these things and working with all these things, and maybe they didn't want the world to know, you know, what exactly prototype crafts they were making. But 50 years later, you know, it, it would serve them to just go ahead and say, hey, guys, we were just working with prototype craft." you know, and it was crashing all over the place and blah, blah, blah. That would have been easy to just go ahead and admit 50 years later. The fact that they don't want to say any of that really makes me believe that it wasn't our own craft at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's so, totally interesting. I, I'm uh, You got me hooked. I want to hear more of uh, more examples, if you would. Yes, yes. Well, you know, there's so many elements of, 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 you know, what came together and all these different things. And, and let's, let's go to Roswell again because, of course, you know, this is well known to people. You know, they said that, you know, there, there, was, there was a bunch of really strange, uh, you know, symbols all over the crafts that were found uh, by the key people. And, of course, they said, oh, well, this was the, the numbers or, you know, the, the symbols that they used on these. And they, they just quickly say it, and it's just, it, it's very dogmatic the way they describe it in the case closed report. It's just like, and that's exactly what they used, and, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, and anyone's a fool to deny that. But they give no backup to that. So then as I did more and more research, I found that there was absolutely no symbols used like this. I mean, nowhere is there any evidence. Of course, they don't say in case closed, they don't say, well, clearly it was used in this project, and it was used in this project, and these symbols were used in this project. It never gives any clarity. It just says this was, you know, clearly used by the government in, in their projects, and, you know, that's just an obvious, uh, you know, in so many words. And, and meanwhile, these are the most far-out-looking symbols, you know. I mean, it really, truly looks like something out of Stargate, and... Um, it's just impossible to think why we used, you know, this, this weird cuneiform-looking writing all of a sudden on these crafts. What was the point that are supposedly just weather balloons? You know, why would they use these bizarre measurement systems that are never used in anything else, and they can't even themselves point to it? It's just, it, it, it's just beyond, uh, you know, that, that, that they think they can just shove that down our throats, that this really, really foreign-looking writing system, and it's blatantly obvious that it's a writing system, uh, it is, you know, they don't even try to provide a backstory. It's hilariously desperate. It, it, this is the beauty of all this, is that if they had not done that report, it in fact would have been less suspicious. 
But the yeah. fact that they do this report, they say case closed, and they have all these things like, that was just some measurement symbols we used. I mean, stop being stupid. You know, of course that was just measurements. Stu- well, okay, point to other times that they used that. Well, we, you know, there's no evidence of that. So they just used it for these weather balloons. No one else has any, you know, um, you know, any knowledge of the strange symbology that was used. They're just pointing to nothing else. Just somehow with this one weather balloon, they used the most bizarre, you know, symbols. And, and you know, it's just, that's just one other example of, of how, you know, and, they're, and, and I'm sure you know about these symbols, right? I mean, they're, they're yeah. obviously writing, and they're very, very interesting looking. And they're, they're somewhat akin to Sumerian, but, but a little bit different. Very obviously a writing system. Well, what I do know, I don't know that exactly, but what I do know is Jesse Marcel was saying on the debris that he looked at that his father brought back home late that night and spread out on the kitchen table um, that the little beams or whatever they were had um, like hieroglyphics. And what he was told or what the story was is that there was a tape company in New York or something like that that had um, like decorative tape that had these symbols on it. You know, and that was that was the response that that I remember him speaking about, which is... Yes, uh, yes. And um, as you know, you know, uh, Jesse Marcel, you know, went on to constantly say there's there's no way that this was, you know, what they say it is. It was, it was obviously an amazing material, you know. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. you, know, uh, it, you know, he tested him this, himself, you know, he, he, you know and, and, and as you know, it was first released that it was, in fact, UFOs. Right. It was yeah, a crash saucer. I mean, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So and, I mean, yeah. You know, I, a lot of people say, oh, "Why do you talk about Roswell?" But you know, Roswell, I think, <laughs> is such a great case. I know it's so many years later, but um, it's just one. Like you said, you know, it comes out. There's a, um, you know, the Army Air Force captures a flying disc, and you know, next thing you know, it's a weather balloon, and um, that's the one I've brought up a number of times to skeptics when I talk to them and you know of course they have their answers of the mogul and all that um another uh, question there's a question up on the uh, not a question there's a comment on the message board by a frank um it's he writes and i'm not sure of the accuracy of this but frank um frank is saying at the time of the roswell incident i heard there was a weekly base newsletter for personnel that were stationed there and the edition that came out a few days later had no mention of anything that had happened, I think uh, if that's true, that's uh, that's another interesting fact. Yeah, I, I I'm actually not aware of it, but I can believe it. And this is this is where ineptitude is actually our greatest ally to truth. Because if they would, you know, just go about things in a in a more normal fashion, you know, it'd be hard for us to feel so convicted in our beliefs. But when they do things like that, where they don't even address a major incident, um, where, where they re- release these reports and say, case closed, case closed, and provide so little evidence and just make blanket dogmatic assertions with no evidence, it only makes us more suspicious. But it's fascinating, and I, and I owe something to that because it, it only helps shore up my beliefs. Right, yeah. And there are some, you know, there's, there's been many other cases and I don't know if you're familiar with the Robertson panel. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there was that, you know, pushing that. But, you know, back when this, going back to Roswell, when it first happened, you know, 1947, we come out of the uh, uh, World War II, um, everyone listened to the government. And that sure went quiet very quickly and uh, faded away until it came back, um, you know, quite by chance, actually. And it makes me wonder, I thought of this, if um, if that situation were, I can't remember, was it who spoke with, it might have been Marcel, I think it was Marcel, a uh, ham radio operator that Stanton Friedman got connected to and, and all that. I'm sure the case probably would have come out eventually through either deathbed, you know, uh, confessions or or something like that. You know, eventually people... Have to have to talk after a while. I think when they experience something like that. Right. Well, there was recently, and, and see, that's the thing. It's hard to, to. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I always tell mainstream people, 
uh, and, and this works, is that they go, well, how come there isn't more evidence? You know, so I'm, I'm going now broad with everything. They go, how come there isn't more evidence? Well, there's people with videos. Yeah, well, those videos could be, you know, manipulated. Okay, so you're just throwing out all potential video evidence. Okay, just, just acknowledge that. You're throwing it all out. Any video evidence, you're just throwing out because that could just be, you know, uh, effects and, and Photoshopping and all that sort of thing. Okay, now what about, you know, um, just recently, I'm blanking on the guy. You may know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, a major, um, uh, you know, Defense Department guy came out and said that you know he had seen all these aliens and he had worked with them in the Air Force. Oh, Is this are you about talking about Paul Hellyer in Canada? Uh, that's the defense minister, who yeah. of course is very intriguing. Yes, yes. I was actually talking about someone else, but let's talk about Paul Hellyer. Everyone dismisses him. You know, whenever I talk about him in the mainstream, I'm like, well, here's a major guy, a major defense minister, you know, who, who has for decades, you know, been in the Canadian Parliament or a high-up official for Canada. I mean, it was a first-world country. You know, Mexico constantly has stories with their officials, but okay, they dismiss that second world, third world country. Here's a first world nation, uh, a major official coming out, talking about how he knows about the tall whites and, and uh, all these different types of aliens. Why would you just, you know, right away dismiss that? You got you to ask yourself, what are you willing to believe? You know, does it have to happen right in front of your face? Well, yeah, I mean, you don't see a lot of things. And, and also, what are you willing to, if I can interject for a second, uh, what are you willing to gain be, being that person and and saying all this and having a career that you have? You can only, you know, damage these days, quote, unquote, you can only damage your career. Like, if you're saying something like that, it needs to be said, and there's a reason for it to be coming out. Absolutely, absolutely. And then the, the big thing that I also like to focus on and and this is you know the one of the speeches I did at the MUFON presentation is that the the biggest facts taking a step back is what is what what is the cause of humanity's self destructive impulse is it truly an instinct I don't believe so and if you look at all the evidence it points to the idea that people who are self destructive don't tend to be highly successful individuals. You know, you can be highly successful and be sociopathic, but you don't tend to be self-destructive. And yes, sure, we know of some successful people that, that are you know, self-destructive, but on the whole, the two things don't seem to mix. And yet, there are forces in our government that are keen on things like nuclear warfare, which no one can win. That is indisputable. Nuclear war, even if all our nukes just bomb Russia, we're still going to feel the, you know, radioactive effects. In some ways, you know, but that's not even feasible. We're, of course, going to get bombed ourselves by Russia and, and everyone else who had nuclear bombs because that's the way it works. The, the, the most powerful nation everyone allies against in a major war. That's what happened with Germany. You know, there was, there was no love between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but they united to take down Germany. Same thing would happen if America went on the war path in a big way. The point is, who then are these people who are so keen on nuclear war? Who are these people that are so keen on nuclear power? I mean, it's just, the, the, nuclear power is just as dangerous as nuclear war. I mean, we've seen with Fukushima, a lot of people don't realize how dangerous that was. Or still you know, is, it was, actually. It's not over yeah, well, yet. Exactly. You know? Well, you're darn right. You're darn right. And, um, you know, Michio Kaku, you know, went there and said, people don't realize that we we're inches away from having to evacuate 30 million Japanese people from where they lived. And, um, and, and, and you know, it, people still, you know, fight for that over here when solar power is so easy. And then you think, well, it's greed because they can control the, the nuclear plants. Uh, but the fact is they could control the solar panels too. You know, it, it, it's not easy to set up a solar power infrastructure. And, yes, people could eventually put them all up on their houses and maybe by making a solar power array in the desert it would make people think of it more and put it up on their houses but unlikely unlikely the truth is they can make a fortune 
They might not have as much revenue. People might be paying less, but it would be much more profit because they're not drilling for oil and they're not, you know, uh, extracting uranium, which is extremely hard to extract. So why are they fighting solar power so badly when they could be making money off of an infrastructure based on solar power? Why are they, why are they allowing pesticides that they know uh, mess with people's minds and that are, you cannot escape unless you're wearing uh, an oxygen mask all the time outside? Why did they fight for lead in the gas when even the Romans knew that lead was dangerous to the mind? Um, and you can't get away from lead. You know, when it was blowing out of the exhaust pipes, you couldn't get away from it. This all comes around to the same thing that we do, that first world powers do to lesser nations to keep them down, to keep them from becoming potential threats. It's just like sanctions. We, you know, it's 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 very broad brush. It's very terror bombing element. You know, where where you just carpet bomb a nation with sanctions. You know, also that they can't. You know, let's say in Iran's case, um, you know, we sanction them so that they can't build a nuclear bomb. Also that they won't be a potential future threat. This this is also something we do in a multitude of other much more black ops, much more under you know you know, under the radar style ways where we, where we, you know, put lead into Eastern European countries, where we put lead into African countries. Um, and we willfully do that now, knowing how bad it is. And, and in, in many other tactics, all to keep people from being potential nation states that might one day be a threat. And as sick as it sounds, that's the way the, the more powerful nations treat the less powerful. They win the race. And then they try to keep everyone from even finishing the race because then they might be potential threats. And that's what leads me to see that there is something not of this world that is affecting our politics. And that gets into that intergalactic political game where I believe we are caught between many different superpowers. Neither one is necessarily the good or the bad guy, just like the, the Soviet Union versus the United States. They chose their allies and their proxy wars based on what politically served them, not necessarily on, on, on morality or anything like that. Yeah, uh, we, we need to probably stay a little bit more on topic on, you know, on, on the UFO subject a, a little bit and how this relates, relates to it, if we could. Um, and let's see, I did have a question for you. Uh, Paul Hellyer has, has actually agreed uh, many months ago to be on this show. He will be. Really? Uh, yeah, he'll be on eventually. We pass emails back and forth every few months um he's always very busy and uh he's rather elderly i think he's if i'm not mistaken he's either 90 or close to it oh yes yes because he's been in the you know canadian government since the 60s yeah um so i have a it's kind of a blunt question here excuse me sir this is on the message board but are you saying that people like hall charles hall hang on just a minute the message board's moving around here um who sees Tall Whites is telling the truth. Uh, you know, it's, it's you know, Charles Hall is a weird guy. You know, I don't know. The guy's weird. You know, <laughs> he's just got a weird way about him, and the way he describes things is a little absurd. And um, you know, it's I, it's just weird. I don't get what the point of his experience was. He was just sent out to interact with them, some kind of nobody there. You know, had this objective to interact with him, and he was allowed to talk about it whenever he was. I just don't get the story. You know, I'm not, uh, it's so weird that it's almost tempting to believe it because he, does, he doesn't try to give a plausible backstory, which, you know, sometimes, you know, that which appears to be implausible, you know, once you know more, turns out to be much more, it, 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 it ends up making sense. So, the fact that he doesn't even try to give a plausible backstory to it, so, you know, so he's either a weird guy and just kind of a lunatic, or maybe there's something to it. But when I watch his videos and the like, he just strikes me as kind of, um, you know, like he's just seeking publicity. Maybe I, I don't know. I, I I find it very unbelievable. Yeah. Everything, you know, um, that that doesn't mean there's not like you know, a nugget of truth to it. Uh, but Charles Hall is not what I use to base, you know, the Paul White concept on. Paul Hellyer, on the other hand, you know, he did seem to kind of leap onto the Paul White concept after Charles Hall talked about it, and that sent up red flags to me. Yeah. But 
you know, there's, oh, there's, a, there's, pardon me, there's a few, a few things, um, you know, I'm, I'm, of course, I have Paul coming up as a guest. I'm not gonna, not going to uh, badmouth him. And basically, what happens in situations like that is I let people talk, and people can make up their own minds as far as, uh, as far as what's what's he's saying. But there's, you know, he's been called out on a number of things that he hasn't really addressed, and and uh, you know, a lot of times that's what a message board or a call-in show is about. Um, Absolutely, someone, someone can address that. And and um, and Rick, so you know, you 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 talked uh, a lot about politics, but as far as sort of the intergalactic politics, um, where where do you see that? Like, um, you, you talked a little bit in your Mufon um, your Mufon talk about about reptiles and how. Uh, yeah, and so I, you know what I can. Let me talk about the reptiles because this is a nice little factoid. Um, the the Paloxy River uh, footprints, I don't know if you've heard about them. They're 100 million years old, and they are clearly bipedal footprints. And I, guess, I say clearly, which is kind of like the ancient aliens guy and stuff, but this is actually clearly. This is accepted by the archaeological community that these are, in fact, bipedal footprints. Well, now, I, I, I'm going to just interrupt you here because yes, uh, go on. we have um, we have a uh, a dinosaur tracker um, who's a scientist. He's probably listening right now. He listens to most of the shows, and uh, he he uh, he. I can't think of uh, what he came up with on that, but uh, he said that is totally a dinosaur uh, track that looks very similar, and he knew the exact uh, uh, dinosaur and everything. Um, so I'm not really sure. I, I understand exactly because I that was a question I said to him. I said, you know, does this mean that, you know, there were people back when dinosaurs were? And he knew everything about that pretty thoroughly. And uh, I would be glad to uh, uh, shoot an email off to him and get the exact. Yes, please do. And, uh, please and do, actually. I would love that because I have, you know, I came, you know, I, I was given a little bit of short warning for the show. So I was actually on the road. And just got to a landmine, but here's here there there is a lot of facts that show, it is not established what that was at all. And I and I get this from the archaeological community. I'd love to hear what he thinks, but um, it it is not at all established what that is. And that's why the creationists were so you know jumping on it, saying, "Look, that means you know we're only five thousand years old. We live with the dinosaurs as a human footprint." It was clear to scientists for you know, over 30 years that these were weird footprints, that they couldn't be distinguished. And in fact, yes, then the lead guy who um, decided to pursue it, uh, you know, found that there does appear to be three toes on it, um, even though those toes are not very obvious, but he was able to tell by, by miscoloration in, in the stone and everything that, in fact, there were toes. And uh, so there probably was three toes, but it's heavy on the heel, and it... Um, and, it, and it, it's a long foot as opposed to the ones that, you know, the, the paws that we often see in quadrupedal and, and bipedal dinosaurs. And uh, it does appear to even the archaeological, and the archaeological community has bought into this idea that it was this type of dinosaur that either once in a while or habitually walked in a plantigrade fashion as humans do. And the only other creature that walks in a plantigrade fashion is the bear, that in, in today's day, and of course the bear has very obvious paw signs and everything, and doesn't have a distinct heel, and all those other things that are that go along with being an evolved bipedal animal. And um, it took them, it took the archaeological community decades to finally latch onto the idea that this might, in fact, be a, a dinosaur that at least oftentimes walked bipedally. They still haven't enjoyed latching onto it, just like the physics community doesn't enjoy latching onto the idea that consciousness affects outcome of experiments. But they have to accept that at least according to facts as they know them now, it is a very unique find. So, you know, I would love to hear from uh, this person who says that it's a well-known dinosaur because, you know, as I said, I get it from mainstream sources, and I'm very big into archaeology, and and, and our, everything that I've read in the archaeological field, and I would challenge anyone to go on the Internet right now and go to, you know, the Smithsonian and, and, and reach out to archaeologists and top-line archaeologists. 
this is not at all a, a, uh, a dinosaur that they understand or know. All right. Um, I'm just going to say this. Um, Ray, if you happen to be listening, uh, please give a call in to the show. Uh, maybe you can just call in right now. That's 603. Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, okay. 603-967-4030. That's 603-9. Did I just say it again? 603-937-4030. I'm 99% sure that is the number here. <laughs> it's a Skype number, so it's not something that um, that I just remember off off the top of my head. Um, so you have written books, uh, Rick, and yeah. um, is it all, like you say, science fact? Is that uh, what you say, faction, science faction? Is that what you called it? Yes, yes, sir, yeah. Uh, the Keepers revolved around a, a potential World War Three in the future, and the outcomes, the technology that's involved in it. And uh, now, uh, as I said, I'm working on, you know, an, a, a one that is based around aliens talking about, um, you know, I was discussing that basically what I was leading to is I, I believe that um, reptilians, you know, actually began on this planet. And uh, some of the evidence is, for instance, those Pilexi footprints because, you know, bi bipedality is linked to, um, you know, human consciousness even more than uh, than than the, the opposable thumb and the like, as we know, we call Homo erectus, you know, a huge uh, leap in in our you know evolution because that was when humanity started walking upright. And there's so many reasons why that is important. That because it, it, the way that humans walk is not is not excellent for survival in terms of physical survival. It's not very fast. It's not very agile, but if you're intelligent, it allows you to survey your surroundings and assess, you know, how to do deal with things strategically. It doesn't allow you to run away from a predator very easily, but allows you to stand there, acknowledge how a predator, and, and, and study how a predator fights and everything. And then, you know, it also allows, this is one of the big things, by standing bipedally constantly and in that particular fashion, it allows for an upright spine, which allows for a heavy head to sit upon uh, the spine to rest in a constant way, which allows for a bigger brain to form. It also allows for hands to be free to hold tool instruments, to hold spears and the like. So bipedality is a huge uh, step in evolution. And, and um, you know, archaeologists, you know, have very little, you know, that they go on in the past ultimately. I mean, the amount of, of hominid uh, fossils that have been found can fit in one room. Uh, you know, when it comes, and, and we're talking about at the most two to three million years ago, when it comes to dinosaurs, we, we often have very little. So when we find something uh, as big as the Paluxy River footprints, conventionally that would cause uh, the scientific community to generate a whole new paradigm of theories. But uh, as I was saying, uh, even though consciousness has long been accepted in the physics community as affecting matter and outcome of experiments, you know, with things like the double slit light experiment, they don't like it. You know, they have to acknowledge it, but, you know, they don't like it. They don't like saying that conscious observation, ex you know, affects outcome. They don't like saying that a dinosaur stood bipedally 100 million years ago. They, but, but they do acknowledge it, but yet they don't allow it to, to make major paradigm-shifting theories. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, that's, that's dogma. You yeah. know, science um, has its dogma. Okay. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that, um, Ray, if you're listening, I'm sorry I gave you the wrong number. <laughs> if you happen to be listening, one more time, 603-967-4030. 4030 is the last four digits. Um, so he may or may not call in. Um, and a lot of times he does catch the show, you know, later, uh, not live. But, um, all right, so... Um, I want to hear, Rick, um, of course, we'll get back um, to you, uh, Mark. But, Rick, what, what, is, what is your background? Well, my background is I'm a journalism major. So that, that, that you know, explains my, uh, you know, my lust for research. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that began my exploration of, of uh, you know, everything, you know, is, is that journalism mindset 
And of course, when I came out, um, you know, uh, looking to be a journalist, uh, the world was shifting. You know, uh, print was starting to die. Um, journalism was getting dominated by punditry, which I'm not too fond of because I think that that the core of punditry is just to cause division in humanity. You know, we see it blatantly with Fox News and CNN. You know, it just tries to uh, put forth ideas in a way that will, you know, purposely touch a nerve in some people in a good way and purposely touch a nerve in a bad way in other people. So I decided not to go that route. And, um, you know, through my research, I, I discovered that uh, there is potential for a looming world war. Um, the, the, this century began a lot like last century. Uh, you know, people don't realize that the, the last century, you know, people, you know, were, were looking to end war and, and they were, you know, they were sick of it. And in fact, you know, America, for instance, did not want to enter World War I. And Wilson, you know, specifically called it the war to end all wars, right. which, of course, was a joke because it led to World War II. And he had all these, you know, idealisms that, you know, George Bush put forth, that, you know, it's a war for democracy, it's a war for peace. All of these things Woodrow Wilson did not follow through with. And um, this is how a century of war gets started, and that's how I came up with an I, you know, a, a plot line that spoke to basically a World War III that would be, you know, very similar to what World War II was to the last century. Right, right. Well, you know, we're getting a little off topic, but I don't mind, you know, I don't mind uh, talking about different things. In the intergalactic politics or whatever it is, um, so I may have misquoted that, um, are there any other, are there any other UFO cases that, come into mind or anything like that? Well, my, the, the big thing that I often discuss is, is um, you know, you know I, I, I discuss, for instance, how, uh, you know, the, the, the Milky Way was, was blended, you know, uh, a few hundred million years ago with another galaxy uh, where the Arcturus stream is now a remnant. And, and basically what I discuss in my books is, is the the kind of causations of of the different alien species and the like, and how and why they're affecting our planet. And uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily speak to specific sightings that have occurred. You know, some of the stuff I've talked about is is you know because I'm fascinated, as you can tell with my previous series with with war espionage, how first world nations. That's what I was first on with my first series, and then I came on to seeing that, in fact, we seem to be a proxy war for intergalactic powers, and so that's more what my book focuses on and why the Arcturus stream generated a different set of alien consciousness and uh, why our planet, you know, derives the reptilian alien consciousness and why there is now a battle between those two different consciousnesses, all backed up by science, not the least of which being that scientists are now acknowledging that consciousness is actually a physical uh, particle and that it's probably linked to dark matter. Dark matter is what uh, galaxies build around. You know, galaxies couldn't exist without dark matter. Dark matter, one of the biggest elements of dark matter is galaxy creation. So the fact that our galaxy is, is the original Milky Way, but also this other galaxy that mixed in that now is the Arcturus stream. I'm sure you've heard of the Arcturians. This explains why the Arcturians are well known for having a very enlightened consciousness because they are of a different galactic consciousness than the Milky Way. I'm not familiar with that term, actually. Oh, you haven't heard? Okay, so yeah, the Arcturians um, and the Pleiadians, uh, you know, are, are, you know, throughout kind of the New Age saga often related to the peacekeepers and and the reptilians are, are generally seen as the dark side so to speak and uh this seems to pan out in all the 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 research that i've done i see okay um all right so you know we haven't we haven't talked too much uh, uh with you mark so you've been listening uh I'm, yeah i've just been uh, enjoying the conversation <laughs> okay <laughs> um yeah, you know, so Rick has he has a lot of very interesting ideas, um, and and they're not they're not mainstream ideas by by any means, um, but they're they're different. And he has 
his facts to to back them up um and you know what he believes are his facts to to back them up and what are facts to back them up and that's something that we um you know what when searching for the truth and searching for uh what it is you know a deeper meaning to life and what's out there there's no reason to discredit any sort of idea or philosophy um unless there is a reason to discredit that philosophy and there is proof against it uh and so so that's one of the things i really like about rick is that he puts so much thought and philosophy into um into what he's into his research uh and so his new book that's coming out he's trying to fund it um directly through truth wonders so his last series he did was a three parter it was called uh the keepers and it was on uh amazon it was in barnes and noble he was doing signings there and um yeah this new one he just wants to try something different and a little bit more galactic and uh and he if loves- I could jump in i sure. want to find out more information which is what Truth Funders is also, that's the main thing I want from Truth Funders, is to get, you know, the Freedom of Information Act uh, to use it for the individual. The, the, the Freedom of Information Act was created by amazing people who are fighting for, you know, basically the average person to be able to find out what the heck is going on in their government. It's the foundation of America, and there's been awesome pioneers since the 60s trying to get that information out to us. However, there's a lot of bureaucracy you have to go through and it costs a fortune um, you know for a lawyer because you have to have a lawyer to be able to do this the average person cannot do it. and I want to find out about everything that the government has and oftentimes you know they, they, they do a number of things they don't necessarily redact you know that's not necessarily their tactic because that, that that's too much of a giveaway but what they do is they give you a room full of files that is in legalese that the average person can't understand literally it could cost you know a hundred thousand dollars Two hundred thousand dollars to to get to the bottom of any one given thing. That's what I want to fund, and I and you know there's a multitude of lawyers out there that are willing to do it, and they've done things pro bono, but you know there's only so much they could do. They got to put food on on the table. So that's what Truth Funders I think could do for all of us, and I and and I really think that you know this is not just for me. I think this is for anyone who has something they want to get to the bottom of. Uh, what you do is you find you know the lawyers out there that are doing this. You get it funded, and we can get to the bottom of so many things. At the very least, what they're willing to disclose, and, and, and it's actually astounding what they're willing to disclose if you have, uh, you know, the, the people that can do it and the time and, and money and resources to be able to fund that. Um, one thing, you know, I'm going to ask, and, uh, you know, I may sound a little crass, but, you know, you, you, uh, I'm talking to you, Rick. You know, you're a guy, you know, talking about facts, but you – I can't see where there's any facts to a lot of things you've been talking about. Um, you know, the, um, for instance, the Arcturians and, and all that. Uh, where's your facts in that type of uh, claim that you're making? Well, the thing is, is that it's based on stuff that is not, I guess, for this venue as much. You know, I want, I want to talk about uh, how, you know, physics talks about how consciousness is a real thing. And, and then how physics has determined that particles uh, are linked to consciousness and how, how those particles are determined to possibly link, be linked to dark matter, how dark matter is the, you know, the, the birthplace of galaxies and all that. But, you know, I, I, I suppose it, it's a different, you know, it's, it's a different set of, of fact streams that, um, you know, I, I didn't have coming in a lot about specific UFO events on, on the Earth. But what I did have was a lot of, of knowledge of how espionage works, how everything that is going on on our planet is very akin to the proxy wars that are done by superpowers here to lesser nations and how it appears that it's all a Russian, Russian nesting doll where we do it to lesser powers and, in fact, ultimately it's being done to us. And, you know, who are these different... Uh, factors, and and that's why I go back to, you know, it does appear that there was a race before us, and um, there's a multitude of concepts that, you know, back up the idea that, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard of of the reptilians. 
I have, but you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced to be honest with you. Yes. Okay. You know that that makes you know. Okay. Well, that's just different. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I've heard, I've heard, you know, people claim that you know, in abductions and stuff like that, but I just, I, I, I just don't know uh, how to how to think about that. So I guess. Um, I don't want to say I'm on the fence. I just say I'm going to say I'm neutral on the subject, really. Yes, and and um, yes. and then I, you know, the, the Arcturians and Pleiadians that, um, you know, in in a lot of the um, the the alien community, it, it's often the the Arcturians and Pleiadians come up a lot. And and have you heard of that? Uh yeah, yeah. I've heard I've heard of these things, and I'm I'm not. Again, I just because I heard of it or whatever, it doesn't mean that I've really looked into it deeply. So that's that's why another thing I, I don't really want to, you know, comment on it. But um, I, I think some of the things are pretty much out there, you know. And, and um, yes, it would be interesting to know about and and sure if there's anything that can link uh, link it, you know, directly to these things really existing. Um, I would be all over it and, and and very interested in it. Yes. Well, you know, I, I you know, if if you don't mind, I have a question for you. Who do you think is is visiting us? Um, I think uh, intelligence is probably uh, visiting us from from other planets and other places. What they are and who they are, I have no idea, and why they have not uh, shown themselves. Um, See, that's you know, what I it's all speculation. About. That's what I'm getting into. See, that's that's the stuff that I get into. Why it's a, why would technological powers that you know to be able to get here, they obviously have you know the ability to obliterate us. Why would they hide? Well, it's the same reason that proxy wars occur. You know, why why would Russia need to hide? You know, a battle that it wants to do. You know, in in all the different places that you know during the Cold War. You know, why would why would America? need to hide anything why would we you know need to hide that we're engaging why would we, for instance you know el salvador tiny little nothing of a nation why we, if we didn't want them to be communists why don't we just storm in there with a few of our troops and just obliterate all the communists ourselves because we can't because we're locked between you know politics both of our own nation where people don't want that within our own nation but the government's a little more militaristic than we are but also with all the other superpowers of the world where, you know, trying to maintain a balance of power. They don't want us marching into El Salvador because that sets off a domino effect of power, and the Soviet Union didn't like that, and now forget the Soviet Union. We couldn't do that because Europe, the European Union, and even Russia is still a power, China, all that. We can't just do things, you know, outright. We have to engage in covert black ops, even though, you know, put all the other superpowers out of the way. The United States could go around stomping over everyone with its military. We can't because of the political uh, landscape. And that's, that's the issues that I more discuss is why are these intelligent beings affecting our world? And why don't they just come outright with, with their intentions? And that's the stuff that I like to address with my knowledge of, of why um, you know espionage has been engaged in, in in our you know on our planet and the stuff we know about and and I take that up like I said with the Russian nesting doll the largest nesting doll being that intergalactic politics. Uh huh. Now we only have two minutes left, so if you um, each one at a time want to just close up real quickly, and um, if you have any way to for someone to reach you that's interested that want to reach out to you, whether it's email or uh, go ahead, of course, for the truthfunders.com. Uh, go ahead. Sure. So this is Mark. Um, yeah, if you have a project, we'd love, we'd love to help you out. Um, we have all sorts of great projects coming through. You know, Jonas's book to sort of help um, reach, reach the youth about ufology. Um, if you want to do research, if there's uh, stories that you have to tell, we we are here. We want to help sort of answer and solve and ask more questions. And so please reach out to us. Um, and also, please um, fund some of the projects that are there because it's it's supporting this wonderful um, community that's trying to find out why and who's visiting us and what's going on. Um, you know, whether you 
believe in it or whether you're a skeptic, that's okay. Both and both are welcome and all are welcome. Um, the the key to Truth Funders is the truth. So please visit us at www.truthfunders.com and check out all the projects. Some of them might not be for you and other ones might be. So um, I really I really appreciate it if, uh, if you guys would stop by. All right. And you got something quick to say, Rick? Yes. My big thing is, you know, I'm I'm searching for the truth as much as anyone, uh, you know, and it, it, especially when it comes to the nitty gritty of what our government knows, you know, the stuff that I think would be interesting to you and your your your, uh, your fans. So I would say that you know the big thing that I appreciate about Truth Funders is you know not getting my book out is being able to fund projects where with the Freedom of Information Act we can at least get whatever they're willing to disclose. And like I said, they, they, there's amazing things they're willing to disclose, but they disclose it with, you know, hundreds of boxes full of files. Like, who can go through that? And then it's written in ways that we can't even get, you know, we can't even understand. And then the logistics of getting them to release it is, is not something the average person can do. You must hire a lawyer to do it. These are the things that I really appreciate about the, the truth funders. And, okay. you know, your fans might have things they want to get to the bottom of as well. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you, Martin. Hey, it was a pleasure to be on your show. It was an honor. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to come on and talk. And you're a great host. You have um, you have great questions. And and, I, and and I really love the way you run your show. You're very thank welcome. You. So that's it for the show. And next week, I'm not really sure who's coming up. I had someone drop out of me, so I'm, it'll be a surprise guest next week. Uh, thank you, uh, Bruce uh, Rainier and Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for the music. Thank you, Peggy Shunning, for managing the Facebook page, even though Alejandro gave you some trouble about it. Uh, you can check us out next week live right here on the Dark Matter Radio Network and 8 to 10 Wednesday and like every week. And we'll be back. And thank you, everyone. And keep your eyes to the sky. Thank you.